On this fabulous century, how Australia got caught with her defences down. The war comes to our front yard. In 1942, the Japanese dropped more bombs on Darwin than Pearl Harbour, and enemy subs came within a couple of kilometres of King's Cross. Was it our finest hour, or our time of shame? It's still the same old story, a fight for love and glory, a case of do or die. just there on the veranda and looked up there. And that's the direction they came from, which means they came from across Bathurst Island way. Team of aircraft in beautiful formation. Perfect formation. There were nine sets of five. 72 aircraft counted in up to two seconds. Today, Darwin survivors like Stan Kennan and Les Penhall can still remember every detail of that time of terror. The next thing I saw was what appeared to me to be little silver darts. What did you think was happening? Well, I thought there must be, must be American aircraft with a big mob this time. And the silver darts, of course, were, were deadly. Oh, the silver darts were definitely deadly. As soon as I saw that, I thought, my God, they're not ours. The raid on Darwin in 1942 was Australia's first taste of war on the home front. And perhaps because of that, we didn't exactly distinguish ourselves. Despite a warning radioed through from Bathurst Island at 9.30 that morning, the alarm wasn't sounded for another 28 minutes. And why? The message came to Darwin at the wrong time. It was smoker at the ref. And, <laughs> and, the, and the officers were away and having their cup of tea. So you never got, you never got that warning? No. The instrument man who received the message was a little bit nervous about disturbing the officers out there a cup of tea to give him the information. So uh, they didn't worry about it except to say, oh, they're probably ours. Soon, Japanese bombs were already ripping into the large fleet at anchor in the harbour. Exactly two hours later, the fighter bombers returned, this time to concentrate their attack on the airfield and the surrounding buildings. It was all over by lunchtime, and the authorities could start counting the awful toll. 238 dead, 320 wounded, eight ships sunk, 23 aircraft destroyed. The greatest single loss of life on any day in Australia's history. Yet it's amazing that more people weren't killed when you consider that 683 bombs were dropped on Darwin that day, compared with Pearl Harbour's payload of 271 bombs. And after the raid, retreat. By mid-afternoon, the road to Adelaide River, a township 100 kilometres away, was crowded with Darwinites leaving town. Cars, trucks, tractors, bicycles, even the local night cart were all heading inland in what the town wags were soon calling the Adelaide River Handicap. Prime Minister John Curtin announced the raid with the words, the government has told you the truth, face it like Australians. In fact, we were told far from the truth. Wartime censorship suppressed the casualty figures and the full extent of the damage and the events that followed. Some of those who remained, mainly service personnel and police, took to looting everything that wasn't bolted down. In the aftershock of its first brush with war, Darwin was in utter chaos. During the next 20 months, Darwin was bombed 58 more times, and just how the locals behaved under such withering punishment is still a source of conjecture. I don't think it what could ever be classed as a day of shame. I wouldn't say it was panic at all. No one knows what their reaction is going to be when something happens to them for the first time. I think it was just the people uh, were determined to get away from the place. But there was also, in my opinion, far more episodes of courage. Today, Darwin has a new post office and the only reminders of where that fateful message was tapped out in 1942 are a piece of shrapnel, 
and part of the wall of the original building now preserved in the foyer of Darwin's magnificent parliament. And at the Adelaide River War Cemetery, a hundred kilometres south of Darwin, a mass grave of postal workers to remind us of Australia's first experience of war on its own soil. After the break, the Japanese war machine turns its attention... The night of Sunday, May 31st, 1942, just three months after the first Darwin raid, and the calm of Sydney Harbour was shattered by the terrifying sounds of warfare. Searchlights swept the waters seeking out a target. Shells whistled overhead. The crack of machine gun fire mixed with the muffled explosion of depth charges. Patrol boats crisscrossed the harbour trying desperately to locate the enemy. Three Japanese midget submarines had launched an audacious raid on Sydney. One of them got tangled up in the anti-submarine netting just inside the heads and was first discovered by a Maritime Services Board watchman. But we'd learned few lessons from Darwin and his finding was all but ignored for two hours. When the alarm was finally sounded, a second sub was blown up with depth charges. But as for the third submarine, well, that wasn't good news. During the night, the third midget submarine had snuck into the harbour and fired two torpedoes at the USS Chicago, which was moored just a couple of hundred metres over here. The torpedoes missed, but one of them came right across here and exploded underneath the converted ferry cutable. 19 naval ratings who were sleeping on board were killed. Confronted with the evidence of their one night of warfare, Sydney siders could count themselves lucky that the attack wasn't more successful. A direct hit on any of the battleships in the harbour might have caused immense damage. Indeed, apart from the loss of the cutable, the only damage came from friendly fire when a shell from the USS Chicago, which had her guns trained downward, bounced off the water and cracked a block of sandstone on Fort Denison called a joggle. A crack in your joggles was pretty serious stuff, and Sydney was in turmoil. But while the survivors from the Cutterball were trying to put a brave face on it all, the local yeah, defence chiefs had some embarrassing questions to answer. The 80-foot-long midget subs, thought at first to be German, were launched from a convoy of five mother submarines. How could these much larger ships have cruised so close to our coastline undetected and unchallenged? And how adequate was the harbour's submarine boom if two out of the three invaders could get through? A week after the raid, while the military was still pondering these problems, one of the mother submarines surfaced off Bondi Beach and calmly shelled the upper crust suburbs of Rose Bay, Bellevue Hill and Vaucluse. I remember the night that the Japanese bombed Sydney. My father owned a block of flats and it was the morning after that we went down and saw what damage had been done. It shattered glass all over the footpaths and such that it was just unbelievable. We cried and cried and my parents were just shattered completely. However, we just had to thank God that we got off as well as we did. In fact, the only injury was to an engineer who'd fled Germany to escape Nazi persecution. His leg was broken as an unexploded shell landed on his bed. But so severe was the property slump, it was possibly the only time in Australian history that eastern suburbs' mansions came within buying reach of ordinary Australians. The 19 naval ratings who died on Cutterball were buried with full naval honours. Victims of a war that had come home to them before they'd had a chance to go and meet it. The wharf where the ferry sank now bears the name Cutterball in their memory. But the submarine which fired the torpedo disappeared. One theory is that the crew quietly scuttled it and sneaked across the city on foot to a beach south of Sydney to meet the mother sub. It's a mystery which remains unsolved to this day. Meanwhile, just two hours after the attack on Sydney, 
another Japanese submarine fired 34 shells at Newcastle. The Japanese sank 50 ships along the east coast of Australia and to the Edwards family of Newcastle, like most of Australia, it was a testing time. War had come to their front yard. The Japanese bombardment was aimed at Newcastle steel works and the dockyards, but the enemy gunners missed their targets and only one shell exploded with minimal damage. Meanwhile, Ken Edwards, an English migrant and loyal to King, Empire and Country, as most Australians were in those days, tried to enlist in the army. We're in the army now. We but the government wouldn't let him. His job as an engineer was deemed an essential service. So instead, Ken ended up in the Volunteer Defence Corps, Australia's answer to Dad's army. Ken attained the rank of sergeant and came home from training at weekends to spend time with his devoted bride-to-be, Josephine. Meanwhile, Ken's younger brother, Tony, fresh from school, got a posting to Papua New Guinea, where the Japanese advance was in full swing. Ken and Joey courted and married during the war years, but the threat was always there. And after that first Japanese attack, Ken decided it was time to build a bomb shelter. He worked for weeks digging up the back lawn, but no sooner had he finished than the rains came. And oh, what the hell, might as well have a bit of fun. Ken did eventually finish his bomb shelter, but after that ill-fated raid on Sydney Harbour, the Japanese onslaught never came. Coming up after the break, what we were told about the war and what we weren't. The secret. In every war, there are really two conflicts going on. The actual fighting on the battlefield and the battle of words and images back home. The propaganda war. And the Australian military wallers spotted the propaganda potential of the feature film right from the start. This one was called, not too subtly, A Hundred Thousand Cobbers. A man's a mug, marching up and down, about turn, pull all in, pull out. Why don't they make up their minds? <laughs> Saving democracy, aren't you? This Saving film was a straight out. propaganda piece designed to remind our volunteer troops what they were fighting for. But from now on, we eat the same food, sleep in the same hut, live the same lives and take the same chances. That's the kind of practical democracy that they don't know much about outside. But inevitably, when it came to getting the message across, there was nothing more effective than the real thing. And I say the government's war effort has been unparalleled in the history of Australia. In 1943, when our leaders held a lone rally in Sydney's Martin Place to raise money at home for the war effort, Prime Minister John Curtin showed he was no slouch when it came to revving up the punters. That means clearly and specifically that every human being in this country is now, whether he or she likes it, at the service of the government to work in the defence of Australia. For the longer shall this government appeal. It will order and direct. And Curtin, and a dog with a sense of history, would be joined for much of the war by another famous leader who liked nothing better than the sound of his own oratory, General Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur fled to Australia after being run out of the Philippines by the Japanese. Not a wise thing to do to a brilliant egomaniac. And after his hair-raisingly dangerous escape through enemy lines to Darwin, the General headed south to Melbourne and Canberra from where he and Curtin would spend the next two years running Australia's and America's war by remote control. On his journey down through the centre of the continent, he'd stopped at a tiny town in the north of South Australia to cement his place in history. MacArthur found himself in a dispirited country, suffering from what he described as a dangerous defeatism. And it was here on the old railway station at Tarawi in South Australia where he gave his first interview to the press who came up to meet him from Adelaide that he uttered those immortal words, I came out of Bataan and I shall return. They were words that would reverberate throughout the Pacific campaign. Words that even today are literally set in stone. I said to the people of the Philippines whence I came, 
I shall return. Tonight, I repeat those words. I shall return. Whatever else you can say about the pompous posturing of MacArthur, he did return, and we did halt the Japanese. And while MacArthur orchestrated the Pacific campaign from the war room in Melbourne, the propaganda machine hummed on. It was hard to tell what was more misleading, what we were told or what we weren't. Radio broadcasts and newspapers were subjected to the heavy hand of the censor, proving the old adage that in war the first real casualty is the truth. And no better or more famous example than this. Australia was proud of its bow fighters. So when this tragic collision occurred during training at Jervis Bay, the chilling film coverage was suppressed until after the war. It would be a long time before Australians were allowed to see these pictures. And maybe it was just as well. When we come back, what mum did in the war? And who is this man dancing on your screen right now? If you believe the newsreels, in 1940, mighty phalanxes of Aussie women were marching off to war like battalions of Amazon. But in truth, while half a million Australians went to the war, for everyone who did, 12 others stayed at home. The sudden shortage of male labour forced both government and private enterprise into employing women in jobs usually reserved for the menfolk. And when ration books were introduced to an apprehensive public, it's not surprising that the film that tried to explain the system was pitched directly at mum. But what do I do if... Well, you know what growing children are. If I have to buy Freddie a new coat, and he has, hasn't enough coupons in his book to get one with. In that case, you or Dad can pull some of your tickets, but only one's immediate family can do this. It looks as though you, Mrs Australia, will have to do plenty of work with your darning needle before we're through. Come on, let's be proud of those darns. Despite wartime rationing, things were never really that tough for Australians on the home front. The local picture shows were packed. And what the authorities knew above all was that there was nothing better for boosting morale than a good laugh. As the legendary comedy team, Ada and Elsie, Rita Pornsford and Dorothy Foster, kept home front spirits high. We have got some happy memories of these munition factories. Better to have loved and lost than never to have struggled at all. <laughs> all the same, I wish you hadn't gone out for that oxy welder. I don't like his tone. I told him off last night. Why, what did he say? He said I was a refrigerator girl. <laughs> what did you say? I said I may be a refrigerator girl, but you're not the one to defrost me. <laughs> Ada and Elsie certainly kept us laughing, but when it came to bolstering up the national spirit, there was nothing quite like a pretty smile and dancing feet. And in the long run, everyone's efforts were rewarded. The happy days were finally here again. The Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Australia, Mr J.B. Chifley. Fellow citizens, the Japanese government has accepted the terms of surrender imposed by the Allied Nations. The war is over. Hello everyone, this is Torbert Duck Madden speaking to you from Martin Place, Sydney. But I'm afraid that today, it's not the old Martin Place that you know so well. It's about an hour since the official news came through. And of course, most of these young people are on their way to the offices and they're just having one whale of a time. This is a very happy crowd. They're mad with excitement. Soldiers, sailors, girls with yellow flowers in their hair, some of them. Union jacks and paper hats. The trams are still running... The young history. man giving this description was destined to make a bit of history himself. It Talbot Duck Manton like would eventually become humans. head of the ABC. Then the crowd, of course, attracted by what was going on, started to mill around the band and to push it around, and at one stage we thought it was going to be pushed over. There were thousands of people in the Martin Place area. This then is Martin Place on Victory Day. Motor car horns... Which play. brings us to the most enduring symbol of war's end, the dancing man. While his identity has been disputed for decades, it seems almost certain now that he was the young Martin Place lawyer, Frank McCullery, now a well-respected Sydney barrister. 
But ultimately, it doesn't really matter who's the real man behind this enduring icon. We all love the dancing man for the pure and simple joy he brought to our world on that wonderful day in 1945. You must remember this. A kiss is 